We ask that you bless each one of us in this room this evening, that we may live peaceably and safely this week and the days and the years of the future. Lord, we ask that you guide and protect each one of us here this evening, and that you offer us all a safe journey home at this meeting's conclusion. It's these things that we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our topics uh, this evening are going to include living among the turbine, uh, soil and water conservation concerns, um, the living in an unending industrial construction zone, the health consequences of living uh, in the footprint of a wind project, and then finally we'll conclude with the question and answer session. Uh, we'll also cover uh, real estate and agribusiness concerns uh, as uh, we are a ag economy, that's our main economy here, and that's, uh, that's our vital uh, importance. And that's why, uh, that's why the good Lord put us in this county, I feel, is, uh, is to fulfill our agricultural obligations. At least I feel that that's why he put me here. And so why am I here this evening? It's because these are fourth generation farmers and their great granddad bought our farm place in 1956 and I want it to be the same thing that my granddad envisioned uh, for them that their great granddad and their great grandmother envisioned that they can pass down. And but now why is the wind energy company here in Knox County? It's for money because they would get a production tax credit. Uh, and I did some quick math. Uh, this, what they advertise, all I'm going off of is what they advertise in the newspaper, being a 300 megawatt project. And that would, uh, if you extrapolate the math out with a uh, cent and a half per kilowatt hour uh, tax credit, that would amount to $14 million annually for 10 years. That's why they're here. A tax credit is just like the federal government handing them a coupon to pay their tax bill. We also have the contracts, examples of the contracts that have been uh, offered to landowners there in the back. We've blown up certain parts of them so that you can see uh, different things. Um, for instance, uh, the, the wind energy company has quiet uh, quiet enjoyment of your farm if you sign on the lease. Um, I noticed in the newspaper this week uh, it said that uh, ask if it affects hunting or not. Well, the, the, the lease certainly affects hunting and you can check out the hunting portion of the lease where there's no hunting allowed within a half mile uh, during construction or maintenance. And it also, uh, those of you that uh, like that prefer to lease out your ground to be hunted on, the wind company uh, has control of that lease, of who you can lease it to and who you can, evidently. And you, as, as me as a farmer, I don't get control when my equipment breaks down. They don't get control when their equipment breaks down. If it happens to break down opening weekend of deer season, then they have to be there maintaining. And uh, the leaseholder, if, if the outfitter has the lease on it, then evidently they're out. And what, whoever they're um, going to take on, maybe the hunt of a lifetime, won't be able to make it. Uh, there are also, keep in mind, it's back there, as your lease as a landowner will be used as collateral. It's right in the lease. So you may have a paid for or inherited farm, and well, it will be used as collateral to a lender. There's also a clause in there about specific performance. And I'm gonna say I am no attorney, but it says if you do not, if the landowner does not fulfill the obligations of the lease, that, uh, that monetary damages will not be enough and that they will seek further compensation. I don't know what the further compensation would be. I suppose they take your land, I don't know. I'm not, once again, I'm not an attorney. It says it'll go to the, to the legal system. Uh, so, with that, uh, 
I would like to introduce Janet Taylor. She's a family friend, uh, has been for a long time. Her life, livelihood, and lifestyle has been completely changed due to the High Prairie Wind Project in her area. And she would like to present uh, uh, her experience. I live on the south end of what I call the Red Light District. Used to be nice and quiet. It's not quiet anymore. Don't let them tell you they don't make noise. Pretend you're down at Lambert Field and there's about six air jet airplanes around you. They do not shut off once they get them started. And they just roar. If the wind's in a certain direction, they are loud. I hear them inside the house. I had a grandson spend the night the other night. What's that noise, Grandma? What's that noise? He couldn't go to sleep. Because I says, well, it's the windmills. And he's, well, what's that noise? What's that noise? They are at least a quarter of a mile from my house. They should be a lot far away from people's houses. I've got a neighbor that the shadows go in every window of her house. I don't have so many shadows about the noise, and it just roars like rum, rum, rum. And if you can imagine having a family picnic, how would you like your family all like to come and listen to that all day and all night too? That's my drive.
that tiny little shape makes the microorganisms move. And it makes the earthworms come up. And we all know that earthworms and microorganisms lead to a healthy soil environment. Um, so we're going to lose some soil health. Um, the loss of topsoil. Anytime you put a bulldozer across your field or a crane, you're going to lose some topsoil. Um, and does all that topsoil that they're moving between you and the neighbor come back to you? Are you getting your topsoil or are you going to get Betty Joe's topsoil? Which one is better? Um, does it come back? I've read that some wind companies don't always get it back in the right spots, and sometimes when you get it back, it has rocks in it, sticks in it. I've never had any terraces built that I didn't see rocks and sticks come up out of. It's part of it. Um, and it takes 100 years to regenerate an inch of topsoil. Um, wind turbines are going to decrease our efficiency. Everybody knows farming around something makes it less efficient. Um, also, even if you remove these roads, the compaction is still there. And that makes it less efficient. And then I assume when the wind turbine breaks, they build another road to get to it. So how many roads are going to be built on the farm? That would be a question I would ask. Um, I've also read that some of our aerial applicators would fly within a half mile of a wind turbine. Anybody put on fungicide or insecticide or cover crops with a helicopter or an airplane, um, that might limit your ability to do that depending on the comfort of your drive, your uh, airplane operator. Um, we've also heard about some interference with Dr. Radar. I don't know if the farmers at your house listen to the weather and plant real quick before it's gonna rain, but the ones in my house do. Um, and what if our Doppler radar isn't quite right? Here's a big concern I right have. Um, it's our bat deck, that where we live, there are three endangered bat species. Um, the gray bat, the northern long-eared bat and the Indiana brown bat. Um, I've read research and there's an acceptable amount that turbines are allowed to kill uh, of our bat population. And there's an acceptable amount of our eagles and that sort of thing too. Um, what really gets me, um, has anyone ever taken out an FSA loan? Um, FSA offers a low interest loan program where you can build a grain bin or a hay storage facility in order to do that, you pay back all the money you get, but only at 1% interest or two, whatever it's at. But you're required to begin an IPAC statement, which is an environmental evaluation on your buildings and your land where you're going to put it. Um, so if the guy comes out and says, you can't cut down that tree, you can't take down that little grain bin because it's a bat habitat, you can't cut down that tree or that grain bin because it's a bat habitat. Um, and the second it doesn't happen to us, I have a farmer that can throw a baseball into this footprint of where this project is at. He has a tree in his yard, took out an FSA loan for agreement, told him to put it someplace else. You can't put it where you want it, because this tree is great habitat for bats. Um, but I would really encourage you to read that contract really well.
mine is going to be in my backyard. Um, my profession, I work for the Postal Service, I'm a mail carrier, but on top of that, I've raised dogs in a commercially licensed, state licensed dog kennel for 24 years. Um, take it very seriously. I have some of the top Siberian Huskies in the country. I've done wounded warrior projects. I've done companion dogs. I've done ESAs. I've done service dogs. I did a Disney movie in 2018. So I take it very seriously what I do. So we researched what was going to happen if this transmission line ended up in the backyard. We were going to be dealing with EMF shedding off the lines. We were going to be dealing with the stray voltage shedding off the lines and what that was going to do to my dog kennel. Um, the stray voltage was going to be harbored in my dog kennels. What we do? We ground them. What I did, I had to replace them all. I had to put wood structures in so that my dogs would be shocked while they were in their, in their pens. Um, and that kind of, we, like I said, we fought all this stuff off and then they went to bed with Northeast Missouri Power on the 1968 easement that Northeast Missouri Power had. And so um, that brought the transmission line in, and that brought us all here now, because that opened the door for what we're looking at at this point. Um, so when that happened, now we're, we've got a whole other enemy. And, and there's other parts of this that everybody needs to know about, especially on the livestock end. Um, three words I want to leave with you guys about, three, three phrases. Um, the first one is infrasound. If you haven't heard about it, you need to look it up. Google everything I'm saying because I'm not making any of this up. Infrasound is, is a low megahertz uh, transmission that you can't hear, humans can't hear it. Uh, dogs, cattle, goats, sheep, chickens, ducks, they can all hear this. Um, and it, it, it starts to work on them the longer they're su uh, subjected to it. Um, the, the next one is harmonic blaze pulse. Every time those blades come around, when they come point straight down, it sends a blade pulse. The blade pulse is just like a rock being thrown into a pond. And so you have ripple, 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 ripple. Every time it comes back, that round, boom, eight times. Boom, eight times. Um, and this is just like getting shot with a gun. Eight times, every time it happens. Uh, the third one is cumulative. And this is the most important thing. When they turn these twin turbines on, um, you're like, oh, that's some noise. It's not a big deal. Well, the first day is not a big deal. The first week is not a big deal. Nine months down the road is a big deal. Ten months down the road, a year, two years. This is when you start seeing your problems with your livestock, um, your dogs, your, your cattle, all of that stuff. Um, in dogs, you're going to deal with irritability. You're going to deal with aggression. You're going to deal with the ceasing of their cycles. Um, you're going to deal with them pacing and, and snapping and things like that. Um, if you can't breed your dogs, well, I'm not going to have any money. <laughs> I'll be honest about it. Um, with your, uh, it, it affects fowl also. So like your chickens, your chickens will start to lay what they call wind eggs, which uh, they get bombarded with this pulse so much, they stop secreting the shell on their eggs. So you get this little wobbly thing. Uh, after that, you find your chickens all dead and poop. Um, dust, the vibration from this harmonic blade pulse will actually cause blindness in them because their eyeballs vibrate to the point that they go blind. Um, on top, of, then you go into the bigger stuff, which is your cattle, and that's what we're all interested in, because I'm sure most of you in here have cows. So, um, with the cattle, you're going to see there's a whole bunch of studies up in Wisconsin done by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and they were they were knee cropsing the cows that were being found dead. Um, one of the things they were finding was fibrosis of the large major organs, which is a hardening of the heart muscle, the, the liver tissue, the kidneys, that sort of thing. The second, once this hardening starts to take place, they hemorrhage. So your cow might be fine wandering around out there in the pasture, and oh, well, this isn't affecting her. Well, the next day she's dead. Well, why is she dead? Well, they started necropsying, and this is what they're finding out. Um, as this progresses, and they're exposed more and more and more, um, you're ending up with deformities in your calves. A lot of the front legs come up, bowed up, and then you're either using them as them or trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, you'll see a 30% milk reduction in either your dairy cows or your production beef cattle that are, if you're nursing a baby, you got a 30% drop in her milk, which your baby doesn't look like. Um, he's going to be wandering around out there trying to hit everything he finds because he's not getting enough from his mother. Um, another thing you're going to see with your cattle is your swelling of the joints because cattle lay down 12 hours a day. They don't just mill or you, know, you see them, they're all standing out there. 12 hours a day, she lays down and she rests and she chews her cud and does things. With, with this harmonic blade pulse and all this infrasound going on, they're agitated.
agitated all the time. They're upset, they wander, they move, they, they, and they're not laying down and resting and doing what they're supposed to do as cattle. Um, you're going to see also the same thing in sheep and goats. Um, the, the ramifications of this is huge. We didn't, we, we, see, we see just a little bit of it with the A-taxi line that's came through. I know on my dad's farm, um, we saw a huge reduction in our crops. Our crops went to that tall, that tall. Um, that line sheds EMF, it sheds certain voltage. We see it with our combines, we see it with our tractors, we see it with our cell phones down there on that farm and go to the other side and the ball. Um, it's just, we need to educate ourselves on what we're walking into. We really do. Um, and I guess in closing, everybody wants to call up an Indy. You don't want it in my backyard. I don't want it in my backyard. Well, next time it might be you. Uh, might be the best way to look at it. So, anyway. Thank you guys for having me. Questions later? Okay, next. Uh, we have Terry Marsh and Nikaila Blessing. Did I get it? Okay. Uh, they're Skyler County residents. They've been living in the footprint of the wind, uh, High Prairie Wind Energy Project since 2008. Good evening, thanks for allowing us to come speak with you tonight. I'm Nikaila and this is Carrie. And we both live in Skyler County and we both live within the footprint of the High Prairie Project. Um, and so we really felt like we needed to share with you guys some of our experiences from the last couple of years. So this quote is from a movie called Dark Water. We definitely recommend that you watch it. It doesn't have to do with wind energy, but it has to do with major corporations kind of running over small populations. So, um, you know, this is about you guys. Your government, the government's not going to protect you here, so you have to make the decisions for yourselves. So we are here because we feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, there are people all over the United States. There are hundreds of groups of people fighting wind energy um, in their areas. Um, there's a huge network out there of people that you can communicate with that have, you have firsthand experience from living within projects or first-hand experience fighting and stopping projects. Um, and so the only way to know is from personal experience. So our first few slides here are just what life was like for us before the turbines came. And similar to what it is here now. You have beautiful views, beautiful sunsets. It's quiet. It's relaxing. It's just rural, right? We had eagles, these are eagles that Carrie and I both took from our houses, um, beautiful birds. And then the construction started. And so, we'll just, you can just kind of like do the pictures. I'm gonna talk about the road issues. I don't know if any of you have driven around within the footprint of the High Prairie Project, but our roads are completely destroyed. Um, and to say destroyed is an understatement. Um, we had, not only did the Skyler County and Adair County commissioners fail ethically, but so did MoDOT, um, because MoDOT, of course, manages you know, our blacktops and our major highways. And they signed agreements that essentially absolved Flatner and Terrigen of any responsibility of actually making sure that the roads were repaired in the end. Um, <clears throat> So th what this is, is when they were starting construction, they were tearing out the side of the road so they could lay rock down to widen it so they can get the blades around the corners. Um, another view, this is down the road from my house, they tore out the side of the road. This is the blacktop roads that were dug out because the potholes were so big. Um, and then MoDOT just laid rock down. Um, so how, how ethically did they fail? 
So the Travis County and the Dare County Commissioner both signed agreements where essentially they only got $85,000 in total. Um, and they were supposed to return roads to their pre-condition. Um, but that's clearly not going to be the case. There are some pictures on here where there's one of the roads is currently closed because the road upgrades have washed out and the road is not drivable when it's wet and they refuse to put any more rock down. Uh, and then MoDOT really is probably where the biggest issue came into play. So uh, MoDOT said we will take care of it um, and they agreed to manage all of the blacktop park service roads in Skylar and Adair for $2.8 million. So you can find a lot of information on the internet. And MoDOT says that it costs $22,000 miles, 22, $22, per mile to resurface one lane of a minor highway. So if you add up the mileage of the hard surface roads in Skylar and Adair County, it's about 73, mi 73 to 75 miles of um, hard surface. And if you do the math, minimum they should have asked for was $3.2 million. So and if you've seen our roads, they're going to need more than just resurfacing. Um, the, supposedly the plan is now that they're going to overlay the road, just a basic overlay. Um, don't expect that to last very long. Um, and we found out recently that they probably can't even afford to buy like a good grade of oil to lay down. So we're not only going to have it not well done, it's going to be with poor products. I have sent your commissioners a document from a county in Illinois that had what I felt like was a, a good road use agreement that really held the um, wind company responsible. Um, you know, having, having engineers look at the project, having fines if companies are speeding, um, if the roads become impassable, you know, they can't use them, um, that they have construction roads only. So they, in, like in Skyler and Adair County, they, it was a free-for-all. They could be on any road, any time of day, going any speed. And your commissioners can put in place, if this project comes to fruition, that they can only use certain roads and that they can only go a certain miles per hour. They can put rules into place to at least try to protect the community. We really felt like we were not protected at all. This is another issue that we ran into a lot. These, these blades, sat in the middle of the road for a couple of hours because they couldn't get them into the field. So that road was essentially blocked because they won't let traffic pass if they're on the road. So if you have somewhere to be, whether it's work or not, they don't care. And they will call your own sheriff's department on you to let them know if you go around them. Because um, they did it all the time. <laughs> so. Just a comparison, this is, so they use a couple different cranes, but this is the crane they actually use to build the turbine and put the blades on. Um, it's actually not all the way up in this picture because they're actually walking it across the field in this picture. And I took that picture from my back porch, by the way. This is the process of them putting a turbine up. This is from Carrie's front porch. And you can go to the next slide. And that's, that's the rest of the progression of that. So this is where they walked a crane across the road, just down the road from my house. So what they did is this sand and large rock laid it across the road um, and then walked the crane and then, of course, pushed it off to the side. They actually did this twice. They walked the smaller crane and then they walked the larger crane. And then this was the crane path after they walked the large crane. Um, this is actually on my father-in-law's land. Um, uh, this is across the road. But huge ruts. They actually got the crane stuck on our neighbor's field. And then this is what happened to the road after the crane walk. Um, I'm not sure how long this was afterwards, but you can see it's starting to just completely disintegrate. Um, not much of a road left there. And then when MoDOT finally came to fix it, this was two days later. It had already broken back down again. So the road, the road in that 
squat has now probably been patched four or five times since the crane walk, and it's, and that's not, that's just from weight. Um, lots of concrete trucks, rock trucks, um, and you can keep going. But. So the cranes, when they walk across the road, they do a lot of damage. I mean, this is what we have to drive on there, guys. I mean, it's a mess. Um, this is, uh, what's that, where they were widening a road, maybe? Yeah, this is what a lot of our gravel roads ended up looking like. Another widening of a road. So that's a rock road. They put down these wooden pallets to try to so that it can support more of their their load. And the reason that there's so much destruction is the sheer volume of traffic. You know, each turbine requires numerous concrete trucks, numerous rock trucks. Um, of course, there's three blades that come to each turbine. There's all of the pole pieces. There's the nacelle. There's the hub. Here, what's this? So this is an entrance to three different turbines. So that's a lot of bakers right there that just get wiped out. An access road. Oh, it's a dirt road. To be honest, I drive down the middle of the road now because I can like be on top of the, the humps if you drive down the middle of the road. More pallets. They'll do whatever they need to do to get wherever they want to be. Oh yeah, and so it's kind of hard to see on this picture, but there is a bright spot right here. So we have three new substations now. Two in Skyler, one in Adair. Um, and I live about, and there's it in the daylight, I live about three miles from one of the substations. I can see it from my back deck. They're lit up all the time. Um, I don't know how far away you are from one. A little less than Okay. And then this is what your landscape starts to become. This is not all of the turbines. This was during construction. Um, you go to the next one. This was this is to the south of my house. That's where the majority of the turbines are. Um, this is before they were all up. Um, it's really hard to get pictures, um, and and I honestly don't feel like the pictures ever do it justice of how imposing these are. Um, this is my house. Um, that turbine right here is about 3,400 feet. It's just another view. Um, so I'm not that, I mean, it's too close, but I'm not as close as some. This is Carrie's house, right here. This is what you guys are gonna be looking at if, if this project comes in and it, it's sited improperly. If you wanna allow this project, fine, but you have to do it right. You have to put rules in place and you have to hold the company accountable. This is another view of Cary South with the turbine closest. So this is the road that's closed currently from their road upgrades. You can see that they took the top of the hill off, pushed it down the hill. So this is, this is a good six or seven feet down. And you can see how it's all just washing, washing out. So this right here. So did they ever you heard anything about maintenance? So our project hasn't even been online a year yet. They have taken out most of the widening of roads and of um, the road upgrades. And they now have to replace all three blades on a turbine. So they have come back in and laid all this rock back down. This is about four to five feet thick of rock right here. And this is the fifth turbine that we know of already that has needed significant maintenance, either blade replacement um, or nacelle replacement or gearbox replacement. Uh, some of them have not even run yet because, oh, go back just a second. Oh, I, <laughs> this is just, I took this picture just the other day. So 
those pictures of the crane path, you know, he's told, this is the crane path currently. Um, they did come in and disc them um, and kind of flatten them out. But this area right here did not hold water before. They came in, disc them, and they went on. Um, so it would be interesting to see if this grows much this year. I'm very curious to see if it grows. I drive by this every day, so I'll take lots of pictures. So just some pictures of replacement. Um, like this, this turbine was up for a few months and it never ran and had to be replaced. Um, that one has a blade on the ground below it. This one's missing a blade. Replacement jump part. This one was missing a blade for a while. And then there is weight there. Okay, I think I'm going to run over sound just a little bit. Um, the thing that I've seen a lot from the wind companies is they like to come up and they like to give a graph. And they'll say, you know, at, at this distance, you're going to have this many decibels. And it's not going to be a problem, or, you know, it'll stay under a certain amount. It's going to sound like a refrigerator, wristwatch, crickets, dishwasher. I think I've heard it all right now. Um, so, actually living in it, the thing that I've noticed is none of it is predicted. There can be winds that are six miles an hour that those things just roar, and it can be 20 miles an hour and they're not as loud. Um, it depends on wind direction, it depends on wind speed, it depends on how the blades are feathered, humidity, um, if there's ice on them. So, um, when they say they're quiet, it's a lie. Um, it's just a blatant lie. Um, and, it, and unfortunately, until you live in it um, or spend a significant amount of time in it, you really don't get to hear what they really sound like. Um, so we're going to go through a few videos, and then we'll tell just a little bit um, about personal uh, effects of it. And then we'll
see the videos, you can come up there on, on our phone, or we have a Google Drive that probably has 150 um, different days, because it is non-stop. It doesn't ever quit. Um, you can have days that are, they're never, they're never quiet. Um, we even had, you know, one one day that was off, but it was turning slowly, and it was cracking, and the gearbox was just echoing, so even when they're off, it's awful. Um, so personal effects. These have only been running for about six months, um, consistently probably three to four months. Um, they've had a lot of problems with them, so um, fortunately um, they've been off a little bit. Um, but personally, um, I have three people in my family who are dealing with headaches. Um, I'm not one to say for sure just yet that it's the turbines. I've always been one you know, to speak the truth about this. But I have never before had to pick two of my children up from school with migraines. Um, I have dealt with some dizziness. Um, there's been days where you have to walk along the wall to hold yourself up. Um, I'm not a spring chicken, but I'm not, you know, I've never dealt with that before. Um, my youngest is six, and um, he wakes up a lot. Um, and once again, is there anything that I can do to prove that it's a turbine? But when he comes, he says, Mommy, that's too loud. Um, that's pretty rough. Um, and we just move them around to different places in the house um, and try to find a place that's quiet for the night and um, hope that the next night is better. And I just want to say a quick thing about the videos is that, you know, we take these with our cell phones and they only pick up the sound in one direction. When you're actually there, the sound is all around you. You can't turn away from it. You can't shut it off. And so it becomes very overwhelming. Um, I don't have as many turbines. I don't have as many turbines as close to my house as Carrie does. Um, but I do have 13 within two miles. Um, my son doesn't sleep. He's two, so he doesn't know the difference between turbines or not. Where we are going to have a sleep study done to make sure there's not a medical issue happening, but it wasn't a concern until we started running. Um, I personally have some ear discomfort um, and ear pressure that um, goes away when I go to work 45 miles away. And then it comes back. Um, it's not every day, um, but it depends on the wind direction. And the one other thing that I think is really important is that um, she referred to it as the red light district. I think all of you can probably see the light. You know exactly what we're talking about. Um, to be in the middle of it is even more. Just, I mean, it's light pollution. Um, and there is a way, if you allow this project, to not allow it to look like another red light district over here. There is something called aircraft protection lighting. Um, it has been around since at least 2016. The entire state of North Dakota requires it on turbines in the state of North Dakota. So if your commissioners allow this project, that should be a requirement, is the aircraft protection lighting. Um, because I tell you what, when I come home, I work in Iowa, and every single night, I'm still not used to it yet. When I come over the hill and see the sea of red light, it is just, not only is it just in your face, but it's also a reminder that you have to drive home and you have to live in it. Because people made decisions that you didn't have an ability to have a say in. So you all right now still have the ability to have a say. Use your voices. And this group of people, seeing all these people here, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by how many people showed up tonight. This is amazing for your community, and I applaud you guys for showing up to hear this tonight.
Let me know if my voice carries too far back. I talk loud. So a lot of you probably already know who I am. If not, you probably know who my parents are. Um, my parents are Gerald and Selma Davis, who live over by Love Still. And uh, before I get into the health concerns, I want to share a little bit of how I feel. Why I came back home from Phoenix is because I love my parents and I love our farm. I love Knox County. I want to keep Knox County how it is today. I want to be able to look out my dad's window, my, where my dad used to sit and have his coffee. I want to look through that window and I want to see no turbines. I like seeing the sun coming up. I like being able to see geese coming through right now. Knox County is beautiful, and I really want to keep it that way. And my family has been here for a long, long time. I, I realized that um, my great-grandfather had bought, I totally forgot about this. He had bought 10 acres over by Jim Bogdanen, and he would raise, he mainly raised that, and he sold it, but it was mainly his primary stash. So, but that was his, his little business he had was back. And then Grandpa Davis bought 40 acres over there by Little Still, Grandpa and Grandma. And then Mom and Dad expanded it. And then here I am. I lost my father in March of last year. And my mom is at the nursing home in here in Knox County. And they are leaving me a legacy. This is a legacy that you have in your backyard or in your front yard. The farms that you have, you're going to end up passing those on to the next generation. And I want you to be able to realize it is the most important, vital thing in our lives is to be able to say, you know what, I'm a proud farmer. I don't have to deal with a turbine in my field. I don't have to have somebody deciding my fate on my ground. Because you basically, if you sign it, you're signing your property away. And that's how I kind of look at it. And if I don't stand up and speak about this, I feel like I'm letting my parents down. And then if I'm letting my parents down, I don't deserve to be taking care of my mom and dad's property. So end of that little speech. But there is winter bite syndrome. It does exist. And again, Jenny had actually brought this up, is when you go online and you look at some of the research out there from peer reviews to scientific journal articles, um, you do have to take into consideration from the university if the university is being funded by green energy. So again, like Jenny said, they can be easily swayed. So you can always make something go one direction or the other. Um, wind turbine syndrome has been um, recognized since 1971. They were being doing studies on this, uh, about green energy, but mainly on wind turbines. And what we have actually noticed is, kind of like what these two young ladies were discussing, is that people that reside in that area, you know, even farm, okay, maybe your house is not right there on your ground, but you're out there every day, checking cattle, maybe you've got hogs, you know, we're going to get into planting here soon. So you're going to be out there for a bit. It does cause sleep disturbances, or disturbances because of the ultrasound, or the uh, infrasound. Thank you. Because of the infrasound. The infrasound, you know, of course, goes in your ear, up to your brain, and with a lot of this, it will cause the anxiety and depression. And with that, you will notice that um, the fight or flight, which like our adrenaline, the hormones that are naturally produced, they go into overdrive. So like when these ladies were talking about, this is constant, it's repetitive, you can't get away from it. Just think about your body. You may not be consciously aware of it, but subconsciously your body is. And so you, you are actually speeding up your heart rate. So for instance, your blood vessels will constrict because of the stress and anxiety you're dealing with. And I just read an article that was presented to me and it was very informational. But with the constriction of your veins, so your heart has 
has to work much harder to be able to uh, pump oxygen so throughout your body. And so when that does, is that it does cause a lot of stress in your heart. And, and in the study, it showed that people that lived around like very loud, repetitive noise, heart attacks in that vicinity was 7% higher than people that lived further out. And another study that I actually read was showing that with the, with the sound, that sound will travel to like a vibration in the ground a, over a half mile to a mile. So you may think your cattle is further away or you live, you know, let's say a mile out, it's still getting to you. It's still impacting even the ones that didn't sign up. You're, it's, it's causing damage to them. So these are just some of the uh, symptoms that people actually display. Motion sickness, you know, um, tinnitus, the ringing of the ears, migraines, psych, uh, psychosis, meaning being paranoid. They feel paranoia because of the vibrations, the electricity that is actually coming off the line there because, what is, I mean, honestly, the turbines are going to be supplying electricity, but here's another thing. They don't just run themselves. They require electricity, too. So, uh, seizures. Um, Annoyances and short tempers, I know Chris was talking about, you know, dogs, you know, can get this way. Well, if a dog can, we can too. So we can definitely face that. Um, cognitive disor uh, disturbances, meaning as a little bit more difficult to make a decision. Um, they actually noticed that people had, had, they had problems more of doing math. So, of course, I know farmers, they do math all the time. So just watching my dad. So um, these are some of the sound or some of the reasons why people do get the wind turbine syndrome. So it is becoming it's because of the noise that's coming off of that and that empty sound that we were just discussing. The dirty electricity that is coming off, which I had just stated, brown current, and then the shadow flickers are the worst. So I, I kind of look at it as like when you're in a car and you're going down and say, for instance, the sun's setting and you're getting that flicker in your car and it's just so annoying. That's what it kind of reminds me of. That's what I'm thinking of it. But it's just a constant shadow So when and throughout the day. So it doesn't have to be at evening. So, but um, this is... I mean, honestly, just take this in consideration. You are protecting yourself, but you're also protecting your neighbors. Be health conscious about your neighbors and yourself, your loved ones. I know some of you came with friends and family. Protect those guys, because the ones that are sitting by you are your friends, and you love them. And I'm just, honestly, I'm proud to be back home, and I just want to keep home as is. No turmoil. tell you as a cattle farmer and since I've been doing this in 2014 how many times people come up to me and talk about industrial wind turbines and they use the three adjectives 
green, efficient, and cheap. So let, let's kind of look at these individually and see what the facts are. First of all, green. Uh, industrial wind turbine, you're dealing with over 8,000 components involved here in a turbine, about 900 ton of steel, about 2,500 ton of concrete, 25, or excuse me, 45 ton of non-recyclable material that can't be put in a landfill, plastic. And over 900 pounds of rare earth materials, many of them coming from communist China. So keep that in mind when you hear the word green. Are they efficient? Well, the answer is no. They're about 35% efficient. Okay, what's the facts say? How many people have been close to an industrial wind turbine and seen it turning and think it's generating electricity? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Well, like everything else, the details, the devil's in the details. You must have sustained wind of 10 mile an hour or greater to produce any electricity. So what's the National Weather Service say? If you go to the National Weather Service, we have about 250 days out of 365 when the wind is less than 10 miles an hour. Unbelievable. Okay. Most of this information for full disclosure comes from Senator Mike Thompson, the retired meteorologist, WDAF, Channel 4 News in Kansas City. He's now a state senator in the state of Kansas, 10th district, an expert in climate, and also industrial wind turbines. Okay, now, let's talk about that. For maximum capacity on an industrial wind turbine, you have to have sustained winds of 25 mile an hour or greater for maximum capacity. If you look at the record from the National Weather Service, on average, we have about two to three days of that annually. Two to three days. Okay, are they cheap? <laughs> well, <laughs> on average, they're about two to three times greater electricity costs using direct current wind energy. Wind energy is intermittent energy. <laughs> it, you can't count on it because you never know when the wind's going to blow. And the cost on a per kilowatt hour is so much more expensive because the inefficiency compared to reliable sources like coal, like nuclear, like natural gas. Okay, let's go with some other examples. In Kansas, our neighbor to the west here, in 2007, they were getting 2% of their, their electricity from wind. The cost was 25% below the national average for electricity costs. They started using more wind, and they saw 54% increase in their electrical prices, which cost the average homeowner in Kansas $1,145 per household. Down in Texas, down in Georgetown, Texas, they had the great idea, let's go 100% renewables. Sound like a great idea, doesn't it? Okay, eight years ago, they decided to go to 100% renewables in Georgetown, Texas. The cost went up $1,219 per household. And a $29 million red ink deficit in their budget for 2015 through two, 2018, a three-year period, over $29 million. Right now, as we speak, in the state of Michigan, there, in front of their Public Service Commission is a 14% increase in front of their Public Service Commission once they added solar and wind into the portfolio. There's just no way to do it, folks, because it's intermittent energy and it's inefficient. It's that simple. Okay, why are they here? Why do they want to bother you at Knox County? 
Well, first of all, you have a cancer in your county. It's called a power line, a transmission line. And any time you have that, they can hook on to that. And they're here another, the main reason why, why your industrial wind company is here, because of the production tax credit. And if you don't think that's lucrative, I've got news for you. I live in DeKalb County, northwest Missouri. 97 wind turbines were built in December of 2016. The production tax credit on those 500 foot turbines of 97 wind turbines equates to next era wind energy drawing over 18, or excuse me, 18 million dollars annually for 10 years. When you reward bad behavior at the federal level, guess what? You get more of it. And that's the bottom line. That's why they're there. Okay. You want to educate yourself? Buy this book, Greg Eubner, Paradise Destroyed. This gentleman's from South Dakota. He lines all this out. If you look on page 41 of this book, he adds up all the federal subsidies from wind since its inception. It's a staggering, on page 41, $5.1 trillion. Trillion. Okay. Wind does pretty good because they, uh, for every dollar of en energy subsidy coming from the federal government, wind receives about 37% of every dollar for 4% output. Not too bad. Let's go over the next point from my friend in Michigan, Kevin Martis. It's a term trespass zoning. When these wind projects are improperly sited, what they do is they place these wind turbines so close to a non-participating landowner's property line that the landowner who's non-participating cannot develop their own land. Say you have an acreage and you want to cut off 40 acres, 80 acres for a granddaughter or a son, whatever. What they do is they put these turbines so close to your property line, <laughs> nothing doing. I've been doing this since 2014. And I haven't met a person yet that wants to live near an industrial wind turbine. I haven't had them do that. <laughs> because they know all the hazards and the safety hazards involved there. And as commissioners, I know some of them are here tonight. On this process, you need, and our, our system is next era wind energy deal, we're dealing with in DeKalb County, and the turbines are made by General Electric. You need to know the safe evacuation area of a turbine. What happens if a tornado comes? What happens if the, they catch fire? What is the safe evacuation area for a turbine? You need to know that, and that all has to come, not from the wind company, from the manufacturer of the turbine. And get that document. Because a lot of times, what we found out in DeKalb County is the safe evacuation area for 500-foot turbines was 1,600 feet circumference. Well, that extends way on to many other non-participating landowners' property. Keep that in mind. Okay, I'm going to go real quick here. The other thing I want to talk about, we're all dear to our hearts, is, is degradation of wildlife. It's affected us directly. My farm is near Pony Express Wildlife Area, 3,200 acres in southern, southern DeKalb County. They worked with the conservation in 2014. They said they, conservation said you've got to have a three mile setback from the boundary line. Totally disregarded, they put 21 turbines within a mile of the boundary line, some of them within a few hundred feet. So how does that affect wildlife? Well, let me read you an expert, a, a, an excerpt from the, uh, from the uh, St. Joe uh, Gazette paper. Now this is the, uh, the company you're dealing with here is the same company that, that made turbines in Ottawa County over in Maryville, okay? This is what a person wrote in. 
said, this is, says you will lose. This is to the people of Nottoway County who want wind turbines in your area. You might ask the people in DeKalb County about the wind turbines. For example, neighbors will be hit against neighbors over the wind turbines, those who wanted them, and against those who don't. Your night sky will be ended, your land values will go down, TV reception will be almost ended for many people, Wind turbines may sound great and great money-wise, but what you will lose for a few dollars will never account for what you will lose. I didn't write it, folks. Right here in the paper. Okay, let's talk about killing of wildlife. Other, ex other excerpts from the paper. Since they erected 20 wind turbines near the boundary line of Pony Express Wildlife Area. What a horrible experience. The Cab County Conservation Area and Pony Express Lake Conservation has been decimated by industrial wind turbines around its perimeter. As an avid bow hunter, I have spent the last two nights there and incre the incredible noise and shadow flicker has driven all the deer away from that area. What a horrible experience camping out next to industrial wind turbines in DeKalb County. Okay, now let's get closer to home. We know industrial wind turbines kill wildlife. They birds, bats, peregrine falcons, bald eagles. You know the sad state of affairs? If Johnny Walker goes out here and shoots a bald eagle, I get charged with a felony and go to jail, and rightly so. If a industrial wind turbine shoots up 30 of them, that's the price of doing business. It's a sad state of affairs, but that's just kind of the way it is. Okay, let's do the research. How many bats and birds do they kill? Okay, if you look at the summary, they have, they've done the research. A summary of bat and bird fatality data compiled by the American Wind and Wildlife Institute in July of 2018 and February of two, uh, 2019, their research shows that 6.2 bats per megawatt per year are killed, plus 2.63 birds per year. Okay, let's get real. This project here is what? 300 megawatts, right? Do the math. If this comes to uh, comes to uh, to work out for this community, you're dealing with 1,860 bats per year killed by wind turbines and 789 birds per year killed. I didn't do the study. Remember, American Wind and Wildlife Institute did it. Okay. Uh, Another thing I'm talking about uh, wildlife, one thing your commissioners should definitely, definitely have is at least a two year environmental impact study. Do you have migratory waterfowl going through, through Knox County? Okay. You need a minimum of two migratory cycles of the birds and bats. And according to the conservation, you have the very rare Indiana bat, was, uh, which has already been mentioned here. But you need an environmental impact study of a minimum of two years. That should be required. This is your county. This is not the wind turbines county. This is your county. You have the right to say this. And another thing, every one of you in this county should have a say on what goes on here. You need to have a public meeting. Thank God in Buchanan County, St. Joseph, Missouri, they turned down industrial wind turbines on the east side of the county. I was there for all the hearings. They had two, two public hearings on two separate nights. Over 40 people got out there and spoke. Not a one for the project. And the commissioners were a conduit of the people and said no. How refreshing is that? So you need to have a voice, and every one of you should have a say on what goes on in your county. Okay. I want to talk about some other things. Ice throw. 
Ice throw is a real safety issue for, again, for wind turbines. They throw ice. We had it well documented three winters ago. We had a lady on 36 Highway get hit, her vehicle get hit with ice because the industrial wind turbines are so close to, to uh, so close to state and county roads. This is important. If your commissioners are here to do what? The number one, uh, 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 the number one uh, point of having a commissioner, an elected official, is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people. And if you're going to do this, you need to place these wind turbines away from county and and state roads because ice throw is a real issue. And the higher they are. And we know the tips can go well, well over 100 mile an hour, and the higher they are, and I understand these are be 640, uh, 640 feet, the way I understand. And if that's the case, you're going to have to have setbacks at least three quarters of a mile from any county road or and or state road to protect your public because this is a real issue. Okay. TV interference in DeKalb County in December 2016, we had over a hundred TV receptions. People couldn't get TV reception because a lot of them like to use local stations, the analog system. They like that. That's it. That's their choice. But they couldn't get them because of the turbines. Property values, a very big thing. If you go to windwatch.org and look up Next Era Zoning Hearings 2016, Clinton County, Missouri, we had all the experts from all over the country come in there and testify under oath for 80 hours of sworn testimony. One of those speakers was real estate expert Mike McCann. And his testimony included if you have an industrial wind turbine three miles from your property line, you will lose property value. Keep that in mind. Okay. They talked about noise and infrasound. I personally have a turbine south of my home, 1,800 feet. North of my home, 2,100 feet. I have recorded with decibel readings of over 55 decibels outside my front door from the turbine 2,100 feet away. And you can't get away from it. The only way you dissipate, dissipate noise level is increase the setback distance from the property line. That's the only way you're going to do it. The property line. And that's the way you protect the public. Because I got, I got news for you folks. Once these are erected and you have a complaint and Farmer Joe calls up and says, it's too loud here, if you think the noise police is going to come back and, and shut down these turbines, i got news for you. There's no noise police. You have to do it prior in the planning stages. Keep that in mind. Okay. The last point, and I'll go over some other things. I've got a lot of other testimonial here uh, of people that have wrote in and uh, engineers that have wrote into the paper and uh, given their feelings about industrial wind. If you look back there on the back there, you'll see a lot of things there that dissolves the wind turbine company of what? Liability from the industrial wind turbine. Shadow flicker. Electromagnetic interference, anything involved with that, it dissolves them from liability. What's going to happen, folks? Who would sign that? I mean, I've had several attorneys look at this, and I, I haven't met any that would sign that for the owner operator's benefit. But the problem is, once you go back to the landowner, any liability with that turbine goes back to the landowner. So keep that in mind, and that stipend or whatever they get on an annual basis for that for that wind turbine on their land, it'll go through pretty quick when you're dealing with depositions and 
and, and a, a trial deal with a, uh, a court system because the lawyers go through that pretty darn quick. Keep that in mind. Okay. All right. I'm going to finish up here uh, with a quote, someone we all know. The quote is, we get a tax credit if we build a lot of wind farms. That's the only reason to build them. Otherwise, they don't make any sense without the tax credit. Unquote. Warren Buffett.
the older guys in the room will understand that easement went across here. The farmers got together in 1968, and they agreed to allow that power line, North East Missouri Power, to come across their farms to bring power to the country and to the rural farm, farms and the homes that were out there. Okay, when Amron, when that was their ace in the hole when we were fighting the four or five lines. And so they went to Missouri Power and Light. They said, hey, if you'll let us use your easement. We're going to give you new poles, new lines. We're going to do all the work, and all you've got to do is let us do this. Okay, well, in the course of all this, they put up the new poles, and our county commissioners could have stopped that transmission line coming into Knox County. All they had to do, Amron did not have an easement to cross our county roads. They, they had no jurisdiction. Northeast Missouri Power could, Amron could not. So they went into, and, and our, our commissioners allowed it. They let Amron cross our roads, put that line in. So Amron, in, in the course of all this, those of us who did stand out and did hold out to the very end were taken to eminent domain court. Amron would not have taken the farmers to eminent domain court had they not had this little project in their back pocket and all this was planned before the transmission line even broke dirt. So this, this, this has been way bigger. My mom said at the beginning of that fight with a taxi that there's something else, there's something else. We had no idea it was gonna be wind turbines. We thought it was gonna be a solar field. We thought it was gonna be a second power line coming through, something along those lines. The other thing that people don't understand is on this 150 foot easement, okay, they offset that transmission line 40 feet. The old Missouri Power and Light one went down the center of that easement, the 150 foot easement. They offset it 40 feet. So they can put a second transmission line across us and there ain't a thing we can do about it. So I don't know that Ammon's gonna buy this. I can't see that they're going to let their little pet project with the Mark Twain transmission line slip out of their fingers and they're going to miss all of this. So we, we, we need to be vigilant and we need to do our research. You guys can look up all this. You can Google it. You can find out for yourselves. Us, the ladies that came from Skyler County, we, we stood front and center for all this. They're telling us what they lived through. So we need to pay attention. Yeah. My husband and I, we both
If this testimony is not enough as to what these people have gone through to fight these people, there's more than enough petitions right here to sign. For those of you that have been on the fence, these people up here speaking should be enough to convince you. Yes. Come on up, resident of Knox County. And stop them. That's the only way, only thing we can do. You've got the forms. When the meeting is adjourned, please come on up. I mean, it is sex. 
we really don't have the representation. They have $9.9 billion to their name. They're involved with wind, solar, oil, and gas. Gas! But they're great. Okay? So, I'm just, it, we have to stick together. As a majority, we have to stick together on this. We can't just assume our neighbor's going to stick up for us or, you know, oh, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and just kind of have. This is affecting everybody in Knox County. Like they had said, people that live in Edina, Barron, if you live in town, it's still going to affect you. All right? If you live out in the country, of course we're going to be affected. You don't even have to live in Knox but own land. Pay taxes in Knox. It's going to affect you. So, and also when it comes to the roads and stuff, when they do put in roads, do you really seriously think they're going to really care about our drainage? You know, they're just, their main attention is about to be able to get all this equipment into these fields. So I'm a non-participating farmer, and I will stay that way. And with those, with them doing destruction with the roads and the drainage dishes, Think about when you are harvesting. All that flooding that will probably occur, I mean, you're going to lose when it comes to your yield if you're lucky to get into the field and plant. I'm just thinking because, you know, heck, it's been raining. You know, I know right now I got pond in my freaking yard because of it, but, you know, with them doing alterations to the roads and the drainage systems, Think about all that water that can actually back up into your own ground, even though you're a non-participator. Okay? It's going to affect you, too. Uh, along with the soil and water part of it, there's a, a case that, uh, that I was reading about. Uh, the is in Indiana, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, there's actually a mechanics lien through this lease. Uh, that's got a property, uh, some properties tied up. Uh, the, the, there's some local contractors that did some work. They never got paid in the end. They placed a, uh, they placed a mechanics lien on the lease of the property. And uh, uh, so I guess a warning to the local construction companies that plan to do business with a wind company, uh, they can promise you pie in the sky. Then they hold up. There's nobody to come collect to. Uh, go to the land, put a mechanic's lien on the landowner. And here again, they pitted uh, one community, community member against another, uh, trying to collect the bill. And uh, I'm not talking small numbers either uh, on, on this particular case. Yes. So they can transport them. 
This, this is something that doesn't go away. The other thing that comes apparent with these things is lightning strikes. Um, they do draw lightning. They do have a lightning protection system built into them. It does fail. Um, there's all kinds of videos of them being struck by lightning. Blows the blade right off of them. We've had two blades. Okay. She's had two, two blade strikes. Um, Cat in Iowa. What was the other? Adair County, Iowa. They had two blades just fall off. After they're built, who owns the land? Well, they'll, they'll be built by, by the company that's in here now, and then after that, they, they're going to sell the field off to, I'm assuming, the highest bidder. And who's going to bid on them for what it's going to cost you to, to get rid of? Well, that's, the, that's the removal is the next problem. That's a great question, sir. I appreciate it. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, uh, let's talk about decommissioning. Under oath testimony, August 2016, Clinton County hearings. We talked about decommissioning. What happens after the clear to be tore down? Now, remember, if the production tax credit goes away tomorrow, those things are shut off like a faucet. Guaranteed. We can hope and pray. But I guarantee you, once their useful life is over, decommissioning under sworn testimony, just to get the crane there, over $100,000 to the site. So as elected officials who are here, keep in mind, the only way you're going to have decommissioning is you have to have cash up front in escrow indexed for inflation annually on a per turbine basis. That's the key. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to cut these things down and haul them off. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't even go to a landfill with someone. Illegal. What do you do with that? A lot of them are being buried out in, like they mentioned, out west. Out in Wyoming. They're buried. So when they're done with them, you inherit them. Right. That's right. Otherwise, they'll rest away. That's why you have to have in your decommissioning agreement before any project starts, this in writing, and you have to have a cash extra account for, for on a per turbine basis. That's the only way you're going to get it. If you're going to have an evergreen line of credit, I got news for you. You're not going to get a nickel. What happens if that company goes bankrupt? What happens if they sell off? What happens if they're bought by a communist China? Who knows? Things change. If, if the company goes bankrupt and owns them, you sell them. They're on your land. It's Bill Foods, owned by China. Yeah. 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 I'm just telling the way it is. So you have to have cash money in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah
There's 197 turbines in DeKalb County, the county I live in. The amount of payment next year of wind energy gives the courthouse $70,000. Set in mind. That's a total annual payment to the courthouse. Thank you all for coming. If you got any questions, let us know. Think about these contracts. Drive safe home. Talk to your neighbors. Thank your commissioners. Help them gather information.
was. I know, but it was fine. I said.